this article, not surprisingly, caused a heated debate. Defenders of multicultural writing arguing that it is just as good as writing by Anglo-Australians, only perhaps quite different. The next major episode in the multicultural literature saga was the Demirenko Affair, which moved the debate from literary circles to the front pages of most national dailies. Do you remember the Demirenko Affair? I suppose most of you do, but just to remind you that in 1995, a Ukrainian-Australian writer by the name of Helen Demirenko published a book called The Hand That Signed the Paper, which she said was an account of her family's experience of the relationship between Jews and um, Ukrainians during the Second World War. She won a number of prizes, and when she received them, she made a big point of playing up her ethnicity, dancing in folk costumes and things like that. It was subsequently revealed that she, had ne she didn't have any Ukrainian blood in her body. She was, in fact, an English migrant who had capitalized on exotic difference in order to, in a sense, exploit this uh, taste for what is different. Um, OK. Uh, coinciding, as it did, with the rise of Pauline Hansen in the political arena, the Demidenko hoax similarly raised similar questions about special pleading for non-Anglo-Australians. But it did much more than that. It reignited the full range of what Sneja Gunev has called the pathologies surrounding multicultural literature and multicultural criticism, exoticism and the marketing of cultural difference. Questions of what counts as Australian and what counts as good literature. The uneasy relationship between cultural production and cultural identity the role of critics and literary prizes in promoting authors and texts, and also the politics of literary establishments. Critics of minority writing used the Demidenko affair as a vindication of their views. But far more damaging, to my view, was the effect on well-meaning pro-multicultural um, critics who had somehow been caught out by Helen Darville, and who were left with mud on their face. The debate was silenced, and it became difficult to argue for and to market multiculturalism and ethnic or racial difference as distinct qualities enhancing the literary experience. It was not surprising then that what Jackie Lowe has called the grassroot politics of anti-racist activism instead turned uh, to other areas, such as the refugee crisis, who by that time, which by that time was, did not primarily involve Asians, but rather Middle Eastern refugees, and to native title debates, forcing the debate about the place of Asian Australians and about ethnic diversity in Australian cultural production to the sidelines, where they have survived relatively subdued to the present. During this same period, however, the international market for literature in English or in English translation has witnessed a boom in Asian diaspora writing, a writing very much drawing on personal and cultural histories of trauma, migration, cultural displacement and the search for cultural roots. The boom has been accompanied, accompanied by a fair bit of scepticism, voiced by writers such as Salman Rushdie, and a number of post-colonial critics, among them, by the way, Graham Huggan, who will be giving a speech, here, a speech here next week, I think, who worried that the marketing of the margins to Western audiences hungry for exoticism, trauma, and a search for authenticity recreates colonial patterns of cultural exploitation and stereotypical othering. The Singaporean writer, Hui Wei Tan, is among many to voice her impatience with Western expectations of diasporic women's writing. In a review of a novel by An Chi Min, she writes, ever since, since Yung Chang's Wild Swans became a global publishing sensation, booksellers have decided that the beautiful Chinese literary heroine is a golden goose. Referring to this publishing, phenomen, uh, publishing phenomenon as Chinese chiclet, 
She describes its basic formula. A feisty, exotically gorgeous woman suffers hell. Hell comes in the form of an oppressive regime, usually the Cultural Revolution, or through abuse inflicted by male power figures such as heartless fathers or cruel husbands. She concludes, to tell you the truth, and this may dis disappoint Western readers who love the mythical figure of the Chinese chick, most Asian women I know, I know are more like Bridget Jones than Madam Mao. Similar thoughts are expressed by many younger writers. Fan Wu, who migrated from mainland China to the US in 1997, writes in her first English language novel, Beautiful as Yesterday, which was published last year, and I have a brief quote here. I can't write a memoir. Last year I met an agent in New York and she asked me to write a memoir about the Cultural Revolution, saying those kinds of books were hot. I was seven when it ended. <laughs> also, aren't there enough overseas people writing memoirs about that period already? My argument then, and yes, I do know it's a very bold generalisation, is that few writers have more forcefully rejected the stereotypes of the Asian boom than Asian Australian writers. This is precisely what Alice Pung does in the first sentence of Unpolished Gem, as it is the course of Nam's agonising in the first story of The Boat. Oh Yang Yu writes with scorn about the current golden age of Chinese writing in diaspora, of writers who have been elevated, he says, to literary stardom for their tale, tales of concubinage, footbinding, and political oppression. Against its will, he writes, China has become the world's biggest exporter of excruciating suffering and ludicrous lunacy. And it is not only Chinese who hold such views in Australia. Uh, M Michelle de Kretzer, who uh, originally came from Sri Lanka, Suming Tio from both Singapore and Malaysia, Beth Yap from Malaysia, Azar Abidi from Pakistan, have all in different ways made a point of dis dis distancing themselves from the burden of the personal, literary and cultural heritage they, as Asian diaspora writers, are expected to carry with them into their writing. Their attitude could be explained as a post-Demidenko defence mechanism, deflecting criticism that they are seeking to capitalise on exotic difference and affirming their right to be considered as writers first and Asian Australians second. However, I think their response is more complex still reflecting attitudes to the past that are specific to this moment of Australian history, such as the constant questioning of um, historical record and national cultural identity, and a strong sense of the ambiguous interplay of memory and forgetting which informs the present. It may be an exaggeration to say that Asian Australian writers carry their own version of the history wars, into their literary works. But it is nevertheless true that when they eventually get around to telling of their personal or national troubled past, and most of them do, their stories come shrouded in complexity, contradiction and doubt. For Asian Australians, as for Australians generally, the struggle over history often takes the form of uh, debates about identity. Who are we? Where do we come from as a nation, as a society, and how do the different components that make up our individual and collective heritage come together to some kind of recognisable, reasonably coherent whole, if, it ever, if they ever do? Identity has, of course, been at the forefront of literary and critical discourse for several decades now, and while it shows little signs of waning, calls for post-identity modes of construction have more recently come to the fore, often amidst considerable controversy, as it is feared that the social and political recognition enabled through the discourses of identity would be diluted. 